right hey everybody who's ever seen this on youtube brand orchestrate people damien clark the incubator brand aid llc today we're having the honor of having the amazing guests ron baker to the show where we're going to talk about multiple pricing challenges so for those who don't know how pricing works or have always questioned what value-based pricing is how can you use the membership pricing model or what Ron's likes to call it value-based pricing 2.0, Canon model of pricing, which I love to use that from the book. Stay tuned for this call. It's going to be very, very interesting. And before we dive in, um, Ron, you also have seven books, but the, the one of this call is value implementing value-based pricing 2.0. So it's $69. That of itself is showing some price anchoring there. I am <laughs> actually curious about that. C could you share maybe a story about that? Like, how does that work? Why $69? Right. No, it's a great, it's a great question. Uh, my, I should tell you, my first book was called The Professional's Guide to Value Pricing, which went through six editions. And that book started out at $79 in the first edition, but by the second edition, it became $150. And of all the books I've written, that is the top selling book. It sold 40,000 copies at $150, basically. The author, uh, authors with uh, publishing houses, I published my books under John Wiley, uh, most of them. The, the authors don't have any say in the pricing. So, it, but I can tell you why it's so expensive is because it's a professional book and professional books are just more expensive than trade books that you pick up in a bookstore or an airport. Man, and I, I love that. I, and I also have seen that you have some amazing reviews on Amazon that shows that the book is justifying the value of it. <laughs> so we're going to speak more about that. But yeah, everybody, we have Ron J. Baker, um, recovering CPA, a man on a mission to once and for all bail, bury the biddable hour and timesheets in, in the profession and the professional professional industry, also known as the pricing canon, by the way. So author of seven best selling books, the one that we're going to talk about today, again, implementing value-based pricing. But before um, we do that, Ron, could you share your CPA story? I know you started as a very young age. Why? CPA, why did you start with that? Why did you shift it the career to being a pricing professional? Well, uh, I knew I wanted to be a CPA, believe it or not, in middle school. So something like the eighth or ninth grade. Um, and when I got into high school, we had a two-year accounting program and I had a great high school accounting teacher. He was very motivational, very um, supportive of me, you know, moving into this profession. And he used to bring in CPAs into the classroom. Not only did he teach us accounting, he taught us how to do taxes. So I, we ran a tax clinic in, in the accounting room during high school, you know, lunchtime people would come in with their W2s from their jobs and we'd sit there and we'd do their tax returns and, you know, they'd slip me 20 bucks or whatever. And then I got a job interning for a CPA and, uh, I started doing my dad's books. I started doing a bunch of his friends and colleagues, business books as well. My dad was a barber and, uh, I, I ran my own accounting practice in high school. I defended IRS audits. So I just always knew I was going to be a CPA. And then, of course, when I got out of college, after graduating, I went into a big eight accounting firm and I stayed there for about two and a half years. Then I opened my own firm and it was running my own firm, you guys, that taught me that the billable hour, the way that we predominantly charged, including the way I charged, by the way, in high school and all throughout my big eight accounting career, I kept a timesheet in all those areas and, you know, tracked my time and sold my time. I even told my customers I sold my time. <laughs> After you start your own firm and you have to take responsibility for the pricing and interacting with the customer, doing the marketing and wearing all the other hats that a small business person has to wear, I realized very quickly that the billable hour was a lousy customer experience. And that's why I changed it. That's what led me to value pricing. It wasn't any of the economics that I teach in the book. It wasn't the behavioral economics, the marketing theory. It wasn't any of that. This is a lousy customer experience. And I want to up my game in terms of what we called back then total quality service for the customer. And that's what got me into it. Yeah. And, and I think, um, I've also read some of Martin Neumeyer's branding, um, thoughts around this, which is we're living in the era of the customer. And I believe that brands should focus more on that, but this is my time where I'm going to put my hat. I'm going to become, I'm going to put the other hats of a learner hat and just going to pass it to Damien. Damien, you have way more expertise to this. So by all means, 
lead us through this conversation with Ron, and I will be taking notes and trying to jump when I can. All right. Well, Ron, I guess it's my turn. Uh, once again, it's great to have you. Oddly enough, today I actually had a meeting with the city council mayor, and our topic of the session was on inflation and supply chain management. And the transportation um, executive that came up to speak about, you know, Tesla disrupting the space, California implementing their CARB standards. Uh, it led it led it led me to ask a question before I even got to speak to you, which was, you know, when 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 is the best way to either bill by the hour, or how do you really decide how to price your business model? Because it seems like a really big problem in the transportation industry. Because you got to pay drivers, uh, you got to pay third parties. So, what would be a, a best way to really price? Um, your business based on what you're doing. Pricing to me means a price in advance. And one of the things I don't like about the billable hour is you can't price. The customer doesn't know the price until after you've done the service because you have to include all your hours. So it's a very uncertain situation for the customer to be in not knowing how much their, their price is going to be. Th this is what led me to change when I started my own firm and why I thought it was such a lousy customer experience. Damien, I can't tell you how many times customers would come in or call me <laughs> waving my invoice saying, why didn't you tell me it was going to be so expensive? And my only answer was I spent the time. I spent the, well, they don't care about the time. Nobody cares how long it took Honda to build their car. Nobody even asks. They, they're not my cost accountants. They're not worried about my overhead and my ability or inability to make a profit. They only care about the outcome to them. And that's when I realized that everything else I buy, everything else that you and me buy in the world, we know the price before we buy it. We violate that law at, at tremendous peril to our business. If we don't give our customers certainty in price and they don't, they don't have clear transparency on what everything's going to cost them, that's lousy customer experience in, in my view. So everything should be priced, meaning a price should be set up front. Now, there are different methods. You can use cost plus pricing. You can use competitive based pricing where you go out and you look at your, your competition and you try and fit in somewhere there. There's other, there's value based pricing, obviously. Um, there's other different strategies, but primarily you want to give the customer certainty because certainty and price commands a premium. Just look at the mortgage market. Most people are willing to pay a premium for certainty in their mortgage versus say a variable rate mortgage. I definitely uh, uh, agree. Look, I just bought a house myself, uh, just relocated from Atlanta down here to Opelika, Alabama, in the mm -hmm. middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, when it, when you're speaking of the cost plus pricing, I, I think that's a, a great example of uh, something that we actually do. And I, I would really like your, your thoughts on it. We do something fairly similar called uh, double zero invoicing. We will send a creative email to um, our clients recapping the meeting, uh, you know, 15 minute meeting. We're, we're, we're fairly precise with what we talk about. It's kind of like a really great LinkedIn post that they're getting. And at the end, the bottom, it will say, your time, invaluable. What I've learned from you, you know, perfect. Next time we meet, I can't wait to experience this again. And then there'll be a little invoice box that says $0. And we'll do that two times and then we'll send an actual invoice based off the information we gather on those two meetings. What do you think about doing a cost plus with double zero invoicing? That's interesting. I, 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 haven't, I haven't run across double zero in invoicing. I thought you were going to say that you sent them an invoice with zeros and then they could fill in an amount and pay what they thought it was worth. <laughs> I, I have heard of, of that. Lots of uh, Radiohead did that with one of their albums. They, you know, they let their fans pay what it was worth. And they said they made more money doing that than they would have going with a record label and getting paid royalties. Uh, I've seen restaurants do pay what you worth after, after uh, a great meal. There's a restaurant in London called Just Around the Corner that does exactly that. And it's it's a nice restaurant. I mean, we're talking like a, you know, probably like a one star type restaurant. And you just you pay what you, th you thought it was worth. And the owner claims um, that he gets paid a lot more than he would have charged if he had a fixed price menu, which I find very interesting. Probably most people in that situation overpay because they don't want to insult the owner. You know, he brings out complimentary champagne and he lets you try different wines and he brings out dishes and desserts on, and says, you know, try, hey, try this, try, he, he samples and 
you just feel so good and taken care of that yeah you're gonna overpay this guy but you're still gonna walk away and think you have value so i i am a big fan of letting the customer pay what they think it what they think it was worth as long as they know that going in if if um you try and do it after the fact there's you know it just it i my experience with that and this again from pro professional services only never worked very well but I will tell you that there's a company out here in California called Gran uh, Granite Rock uh, or Granite uh, Granite Rock. And they have a thing called short pay. And when they send an invoice, if you're not happy with any aspect, now these guys do cement, <laughs> you know, they deliver yeah. cement and cement's a, a just in time product. I mean, when a construction site is ready to pour concrete, that truck better be there. Otherwise you're costing the developer a fortune. People standing around waiting for the cement truck to get there. So service is a big thing in their world. And they send an invoice and you can short pay it. Oh, if, wow. if you don't, if it, you just, you just vo voluntarily lop off any amount you didn't think that they, um, you know, that, that it doesn't justify you. You're not happy with their service. And when they first did this, um, it, it was costing them about three to five percent of gross sales. That's what it, it, these, the short pay was, and that's a lot of money in the in the concrete business because it's a low margin business. But what what it taught them was every time somebody short paid them, it showed them a service failure, and it forced them to improve upon it. Today, the short pay is less than one percent, mm. and because of that short pay, of course, they command a price premium. People are willing to pay for that level of satisfaction and guaranteed satisfaction. Just think of FedEx. You know, FedEx doesn't deliver. You don't pay. They don't blame it on the airport weather. They don't blame it on traffic. They don't, you know, they don't drop it on your doorstep at 830. You don't pay. So I love guarantees like that. I think we don't see enough of them. Now, great companies have great guarantees. FedEx, Nordstrom. L.L. Bean, Gore-Tec, I can go down the list. Disney has a great guarantee, believe it or not. Uh, not many people know about it. Nordstrom, uh, Neiman Marcus, all these companies have great guarantees. Um, and I think more companies should do that because a great guarantee commands a premium price. Yeah, def definitely right. Uh, you know, it's kind of like your, your book lab now, um, value-based pricing. Um, it, it's 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 expensive. I'm not going to lie, but I have any, I still have three chapters to go in your eight steps and the lessons that I have just learned and added to, and even implemented into the pricing of our, you know, business accelerator or our one-on-one -on -one work that we do with clients, even as of this month have almost like doubled our income from last month. It wow. is it's just amazing how like these small little changes can help in the long run. And but and and uh, uh, Damien, I'm not sure I answered your question about the cost plus. Just let me say, I'm not a fan of cost plus pricing because it's silent with respect to value. It's an internal looking pricing mechanism that says, okay, what's our cost? What's our desired profit? It doesn't look out to the customer and say, what is the value that we're delivering? And just like you found out in your business, which I, you know you guys do a lot of consulting, I gather, and mentoring and coaching and things like. I mean. It's all about creating results for the for the customer. I mean, I have to do that when I write a book. If I don't create the outcome for the customer that that gives them more profit or more satisfaction in their business, it doesn't matter how long I spent writing the book or how much it costs the publisher to buy the paper and print it if it's not generating an outcome. The world just doesn't owe me a living. Right. I just can't say, well, look, I spent all this money and all this time. You, you have to at least recover my time. No, nobody has to do that. Customers don't care about that. I, I want to jump to that. And I think uh, th that was what I was setting a bait for at the beginning when it comes to the $69 for the book. <laughs> I almost was going to say, if you're going to pay, like how, how it's like creating an irresistible offer that people would feel saying no, feel stupid saying no to. So I was like, you would buy this book a hundred times if you know that if you read just one or two pages of it, you're going to make like 10 times more money than how much it's worth. So and, and, and th that's this just is the, crazy. And, and this is the risk of putting a fixed price on that book, because I think if, if people were able to access the book and read it and then use some of the principles and get results like you guys did, then I they would probably be willing to pay more. Mm. But th so there's that constant trade-off of, 
you know, letting the customer decide versus giving them certainty and, and just having clean, transparent pricing. And also there's a, there's a bureaucratic cost of trying to price each and every customer. You know, it takes more time. You have to put more thought into it. It's not as scalable. Maybe if you're trying to have, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of customers. So there's all sorts of trade-offs with all of this. I mean, there's no easy answers. It, it's going to depend on the business and the business model. Think of Uber, you know, Uber's got this incredible surge pricing that tries to match in real time supply and demand. So if there's a concert or there's a, you know, bad weather somewhere and it's raining and there's no cabs or whatever, Uber can surge the price to get the drivers off their couch. You know, they're sitting home watching football games. How do you, how do you get the guy or gal off their couch, you know, watching their Netflix story? to go and drive for Uber. Well, you surge price it. You give them an incentive to get up and earn more money in less time. Um, and it's pretty effective, actually. Yeah. That's great pricing because that makes for a better customer experience. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And you were speaking on the surge pricing. Uh, my father um, actually went down to work with FEMA um, as a soldier when they had the Hurricane Katrina. Mm -hmm. And there was a big, you know, it's on, I'm sure you saw it on the news, the, the prices of goods and services started to surge, commodities started swinging, and there were literally debates uh, in local, national level of like, should, it, should FEMA be charging this much? Should people who are getting paid be getting paid this much, like these traveling nurses who are going down there to help? Like, when it comes to commodities that are starting to shift their business model toward value-based pricing, you know, when it, when is it really appropriate to do that? And when isn't it appropriate? Yeah, well, that's, you know, a lot of states have anti-gouging laws during natural disasters where if you try and bump up the price of water or lumber or flashlights or generators, you know, you could be subject to prosecution. I think those laws are really stupid. I mean, one of the things that the price system does just at a macro level is it allocates goods and resources to where they're needed the most. So if you've got Hurricane Katrina and they need lumber and they need water, how do I get that truck driver sitting in Ohio watching the football game? How do I get him in, into his truck driving needed goods down to uh, Katrina, you know, to, to uh, Louisiana? Well, if you pay him more, he'll do it. Uh, how do you get Walmart to d diverse, uh, divert uh, needed supplies from one store to another? Well, if they have a chance to make more money, then they're going to do it. Plus, it forces people to allocate. You know, if, if the prices stay the same and the demand surges, then what's the incentive for me not to go with my family to a hotel and book four rooms? <laughs> you know, but if the if the cost of the room went up four or five times, now I'm going to economize and that's going to make more rooms available to more people. You know, it does no good to hold the price low if I can't buy the good. So true. I, I believe that's true. And and why, why do you think people really or businesses uh, really try to hold on to their pricing and not be flexible? Why do you think that is? Sometimes it's repu they're worried about reputation. They realize that it's not just a, a you know, business, as they say, is an infinite game. It's not a finite game. They're going to have more interactions. So I remember uh, what was that really bad hurricane in Florida? I forget. It was way before Katrina. I, I forget the name of it. But, but Home Depot diverted a bunch of wood and lumber and other needed supplies from all their various stores, got it down to Florida and they didn't raise their price, that probably bought them millions of dollars worth of goodwill. Now, if you're Home Depot, you can do that because you have economies of scale and you buy things you know, in great quantity. If you're a mom and pop hardware store that's got one location, that's much harder to do. So I, I, I think people are worried about their, their reputational risk if they adjust pricing too much. Um, the airlines learn this, I think, the hard way. Uh, you know, the uh, people, people are really frustrated when they refresh their browser and their airline ticket went up, you know, before they bought it. Hotels are kind of doing the same thing to people right now. Um, but it, my, my attitude on this is if a customer buys at a high price, there had to be more value delivered to the customer. Otherwise they wouldn't have bought it. Nobody's putting a gun to their head and forcing them to buy something. So the, the, the way economists measure and think about this and measure it 
is when you go buy something, not only does hopefully the store make a profit, and that may or may not be true, but hopefully it is for them, but also the customer makes a profit. And how do we know that? Well, ever notice that when we buy something, both sides to the transaction say thank you? The barista hand you, hands you your coffee, you hand the $5, you both say thank you. There's that double thank you moment. If both sides didn't think they were profiting from that transaction, it wouldn't have happened. And because both said thank you, that means they did. Otherwise, one of them would have said you're welcome. I have a, a great story to this. Um, and this happened like literally today. Um, I was talking to to someone who I see as an idol, someone that I can learn a lot from it, from him. But the other coin of this conversation is that he's so expensive that at this point in my business, in my career, I cannot afford him just yet. So we had some enter like an interchange of conversations during the year, and at some point, it's almost like I showed him my potential. I showed him what I can do. And I kept that relationship ongoing, even though we stopped like doing conversations together. We were just like supporting each other just because I like your work. I'm going to be a big fan of it. I'm going to support it everywhere. And he noticed that. And I just sent him like happy, happy Christmas and all of that. And I asked him, how is your coaching business going? And he said, I'm trying something new. He said, I'm trying to, I'm learning something and I'm trying to teach a couple of people about it would you be open if i onboard you to this for free like he didn't even ask for money and i was like oh my god this is my chance to actually learn from this person yes sign me up and he said thank you and i said no thank you and that was like a win-win scenario so amazing. absolutely yeah and, and and that's great when you have somebody like that who's very expensive and then opens up a program where you feel like you're really special get, if you get a deal or especially a no price. Um, that feels really good. Well, it's been amazing to have you, Rana. We appreciate that you were able to not only share, you know, your experience with us, but with everybody that's, that's watching this and that everybody that who is going to be watching this here on, on LinkedIn, YouTube, all of our social channels. Um, but before we go real quickly, um, you know, where can we buy your book at and, you know, where can we go to learn more about these topics and uh, resources that you share with us today? Okay. Well, I'm all over social media, so you can find me on LinkedIn and I'm one of the, uh, first influencer LinkedIn influencer bloggers. So I have lots of posts up there that talk about pricing and even after action reviews and a whole bunch of other topics. Um, you can find me at Twitter at Ronald Baker. You can also find me at the soul of enterprise.com. That is the, I do a live radio show every Friday, but then it drops to podcasts. So it's a podcast really. Um, I do that with my co-host Ed class and we've done shows on subscription. We've talked to a direct primary care physician, um, that, you know, the, the, these people are disruptors. They're just, they're real pioneers, uh, blazing the trail for how medicine is delivered in this country at a much more affordable price point. You can get the book at Amazon, both implementing value pricing, the one that you held up Damien, uh, and uh, my new book, which just came out late November called times up the subscription business model for professional firms. You can also get that on Amazon. Both are available also on Kindle at Amazon. You can also get it at Barnes and Noble and Target and Books a Million and all the other places that sell books. But more, most importantly, if you go to the soul of enterprise.com, that will give you additional benefits to the Time's Up book. So for, ex for example, we did a bunch of audio recordings of one per chapter of recording. Now it's not an audio book, but what we did was my co-host interviewed me about the chapter or the main ideas in the chapter. I gave insights about things that I didn't put in the chapter that I wish I would have, or that got cut in editing or whatever. So there's just little bonuses throughout. And we do that for all 23 or four chapters in the book. And we're also going to have a community to help people move to or pivot to a subscription model. Um, so if they go to the soul of enterprise.com slash Time's up. Send us a copy of their receipt from Amazon when they buy the book and they'll be included in this club. And we also have some Q&A events planned and me and my co-author, Paul Dunn, who I wrote the book with, will also be on those calls. And um, so, and we're going to, we're going to add more benefits as we roll forward because I'm a big believer in the subscription model. So I'd like to see more firms do it. 
Well, thank you both. I will do my job to put all these links and resources in the description on wherever you're going to watch this so that you can actually join this. And we're also going to share this in YouTube, in our newsletters and so on. So yeah, thank you, Ron. Thank you, Damien. Amazing interview, amazing value. This is a valuable interview, I must say. My mind is running like crazy. Well, thank you, Amin, and thank you, Damien, for having me. It's so, been an honor. So much for talking to Well, thank you. And yeah, until we see you again, thank you. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you in traffic. I'm Ron Baker, and I'll see you in traffic.